of us are in situations that we did not create ourselves. Ancestrally and culturally, we have learned words that are not in line with God's word and simply cannot produce anything other than what they've been directed to produce. I cannot change my life unless I'm willing to change my words. Faithful words are the most powerful tools known to man. I can stop a, I can stop a, listen, I'm gonna use this one because it's just, I can stop a truck, that truck from coming over into my lane with my words more than I can my ability to drive. Hallelujah. Everybody close your eyes. Close your eyes. Trust me on this one. Just close your eyes. I ain't gonna throw nothing at you. Nobody's gonna run up and touch you. Imagine if you didn't have any eyes. Imagine if you couldn't see anything. Imagine if your entire world was dark. Okay? What would it be like? How would you perceive life to be? How would you perceive God to be? If you could not see. Now join with me in prayer. Father, I thank you so much that you've given us eyes to see. <coughs> Not just natural eyes, we thank you for those. But most importantly, we thank you for spiritual eyesight, spiritual insight. We're not blind. We're not the blind leading the blind. We are aware and awake to righteousness. We understand the magnitude of what the message has been from the days of old. Since before Jesus came, you've been drawing us closer and into a greater understanding of purpose and and assignment and kingdom reality. And today, Father, is no exception. So we open our eyes with new understanding. Oh my God, I give you praise. I pray for every person that is suffering from spiritual blindness today, that their eyes would no longer be blinded to the reality of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. I come against the spirit of darkness, pervasive darkness, intruding darkness that is moving, trying to move into our very most precious private times. God, when we would get closer to you, the Bible says in, in Romans 7 that sin is always present with me. So I come against the very spirit of sin, the demonic influence of darkness, and declare that the entrance of your word brings light. So let your word be preached and taught and received in this place today so that bright light that illuminates all of heaven will shine in our hearts and just dispel and eradicate darkness. Dark thoughts, dark words, all of it be gone in Jesus' name. Come on and give the Lord a hand of praise. Would you do that this morning? <laughs> praise God. Glad you're here, delighted you're here. Certainly honored that you would uh, take time to come to LifePoint uh, here in the western corner of uh, the metro Iowa City area, so to speak. We're here, and um, I'm just glad that you're here. It's not an easy place to get to for a lot of people, so most of us have to take a little time to get here, and I thank you for waking up to do that this morning. I trust that your time will not be wasted, that your time will be a good investment. Um, I'm not one who believes in wasting time. I have a tendency, a lot of people say I talk too much, but that's only because there's a lot to be said about the kingdom. And so I challenge you if, you know, if it's, you know, if you can find someplace else that's better for you, uh, you need to be there. Amen. I love having you here, but I want you to get the most out of your kingdom experience. And so there are many offerings today all over the county and the cities. And, and although I love having you here, I want you to be where God wants you to be. Amen. That's where you're going to get the best out of your life. Can you say amen to that? Uh, I want to make one quick announcement. Many of you may get the email or may have gotten the email. We will be having a special guest on Wednesday here. Um, would love to have you come out if you can. Don't stay home and watch Dancing with the Stars and all that other stuff that you could do another time. There's a special speaker here, uh, Linda Edwards. She's been here. It's been a couple years since Linda's been here, uh, fresh back in the country from Israel. And uh, she, is, she is what I'm going to say from a military standpoint, boots on the ground. Um, she's there. She, she spends a lot of time there over the last, boy, since we've known her. She's been, uh, spent more time in Israel than she has in the United States. And so she was passing through to say hello to my wife and I and love on us. We haven't seen her in a little bit. And so I invited her to come speak on Wednesday night. Love to have you out here. 
you won't be disappointed. So I hope you can make time for that in your busy schedules. Uh, I invite you, if you would, to turn. We were talking last week about restraining the tongue or putting a check on it. And I want to, the Lord has kind of got me in this place where I'm trying uh, to decipher, I know the information is there, decipher what it is he wants me to say to you today um, so that we can maximize our few moments here together. So in the next 35 minutes is what I've uh, got roughly. I want to make sure that I communicate this to you in such a way that you'll understand it. If you weren't here, I invite you to go back and listen to the message. Uh, I imagine it's on YouTube. Uh, also, there may be a CD available to you, but I encourage you not to just figure, well, I didn't need that because you do need it. Um, you do need it. Say, I do need it. Uh, I need any, any and all of the word that I can get, um, and I need it at a higher level than I currently have right now. So it keeps me moving in the right direction. Praise God. I'm delighted this morning. So with that, let's, let's turn. I'm going to invite you to turn with me to James, the third chapter. Gentlemen, if you would put up the New Living Translation, as it says in your notes, James, the third chapter. Before I get into that, I want to, again, today's topic is going to be on restraining your tongue or check that part two. This is part two of that. Um, this is still the power of the tongue series. Now, um, you can write these scriptures down as you hold your place in James. You don't have to turn here, but just write these down because I want you to hear these because they will they are pertinent to what we're going to talk about today. One is Numbers, the book of Numbers 32 verses 22 through 24. Just write them down. Don't turn there. Numbers 32, verses 22 through 24. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And it says, And the land be subdued before the Lord. Then afterward you shall return and be guiltless before the Lord and before Israel. And this land shall be your possession before the Lord. But if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord. And be sure that your sin will find you out. Build your cities for your little ones and folds for your sheep and do that which have proceeded out of your mouth. Let me have something to drink, please. Um, do that which have proceeded out of your mouth. I want you to say this with me. Say, I will, I will. Do, that do that which has proceeded, which has proceeded out, of out of my mouth. Turn to somebody and say it. Make eye contact because eye contact is very important. Say, I will, I will. Do, that do that which proceedeth out of my mouth. Many people try to do things that everybody else tells them, but the reality of it is, is that you and I are more inclined to do the things which come out of our own mouth more than what we will do what somebody else tells us to do. Can you say amen to that? The next verse is this. Don't turn there. Just write it down. Proverbs 16, 22 through 24. Proverbs 16, 22 through 24. I'm going to read this from the King James Version. It says, understanding is a wellspring of life unto him that hath it. But the instruction of fools is folly. I should have given you another translation, but that you can look it up for yourself. Understanding is a wellspring of life unto him that has it. That implies that everybody doesn't have it. But the instruction of fools is folly. In other words, you can't, it's hard to teach a fool anything. The heart of the wise, listen, teaches his mouth and adds learning to his lips. The heart of the wise teaches his mouth and adds learning to his lips. Pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, and health in the bones. The words that we speak are so significant that I believe my, my continual talking about this, I can't put enough emphasis on it. You know, many times as a preacher, you want to move on to something else. You want to do something more exciting. You want to see this or that or this kind of thing happen. But what I recognize is that the best thing that I could ever do for you is to do what God tells me to do for you, to teach what God wants me to teach for you. Now, over in the book of James, before I read there, I want you to understand this, and let's, let's get this in context. There, there are more references to words. Listen to these two things. You can study it out for yourself. Words and finances in the Bible than anything else. That's the truth. Now, you study it out for yourself. There are more references and inferences to words in the Bible and finances and money or material things. You won't see dollars in there. There were no dollars around, okay? <clears throat> but there were enough inferences. And, and I'm going to tell you who the greatest teacher on material things was, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and he used parables and illustrations that people could understand in the day. So you take that. Don't take my word for it. You do your own homework. Amen? With that being said about the words aspect of it, there is no place in the Bible, in the Bible, other than the book of James, that tells us really the significance of how important our words are. No place. You can't go into the Old Testament and find, you can find the, the Proverbs of Solomon, and you can find all of those things, and those things are good, and they're, they're, they're important, but James seems to have something in terms of insight that most people don't have. It is probably, doctrinally speaking, the word doctrine means teaching, doctrinally speaking, it's probably the most sound book of practical wisdom as if, as if it were pulled out of the Old Testament and set into a New Testament context. It's as if James looked into the Old Testament, and I've talked, you know, I'm not going to get into this part, but he grew up in the household of Jesus. Joseph and Mary were his, were his parents, and it's as if he looked at his life in the context of the current situation and realized that there was something about the Old Testament that he simply got a revelation of. Are you hearing me this morning? So with that in mind, I want to read this. I'm going to read this whole, this whole verses 1 through 18, and they're going to put up the New Living Translation because it's a good translation, but I'm going to read it from the King James Version. Are you ready? Okay, you can just follow along with me. It says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation or judgment. Speaking of teachers, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man. Translate the word perfect to mature man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we turn about their whole body. Verse 4. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great or so massive, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, or rudder, some would say, some translations say whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so, verse 5, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire. Make note of that. Mark it in your Bible, however it is you take notes. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature, or humanity. And it is set on fire of, one translation says, Gehenna, or hell. For every kind of beasts, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Verse 9, therewith, bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude, or the likeness of God. Verse 10, out of the same mouth proceedeth blessings and cursings. He says, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water, or fresh water, and salt water? Can the fig tree, my brothers, bear olive berries, either of vine, figs? so can no fountain yield salt water and fresh. Verse 13, who is wise, who is a wise man, and endueth with knowledge, endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good lifestyle, or King James Version says conversation, his works with meekness of wisdom. Verse 14, but if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the word or against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Now, that's a lot of reading, probably more than most people have done all week. But understand that your tongue is greater than any atomic nuclear device, any ballistic device, any weapon formed of mankind. Your tongue and my tongue is, has the ability to be a life giver or it has the ability to be an assassin. 
most people don't understand that the power of the things that they speak is really what forms their life. Now, if I were walking down Walmart, my, one of my favorite places, and I'm walking through, I have a tendency, my wife can bear witness to this, and maybe some of you can bear witness to this, I don't say much. I've learned to keep my mouth closed because I see things that cause me to want to say something and it might turn out to be an assassin's bullet rather than a life-giving force. I see things that I know that are not in line with God's word. I see things, and I know you do too, I see things that I wish that I could say something about. Glory to God. I see things that I wish that I could somehow or another just, you know, give somebody a piece of my little mind and make sure they understand that what they're doing is wrong. Oh, I guess I'm the only one that's ever done that. Okay, so with, with that, though, I also understand that there has to be an understanding of wisdom and a governance of the Holy Ghost before I open my mouth to speak. There's a message that I've listened to many years. I've had it for many years, and it says, and it's geared towards ministers, and it says the title of it is Before You Speak. Many people have not understood that before you speak, the best thing you should do is engage your brain. A lot of people have challenge with that. A lot of people feel like they must give a piece of their mind, even if nobody asks for it. And I had somebody tell me, well, I don't have much to give, and that tells me that's good. Maybe you need to keep your mouth closed. But at any rate, at any rate, James writes with the understanding that, and he says this plainly, he says that the tongue is full of deadly poison. Now, listen, listen to me. There's a couple things I, I, I'm going to try to get through as much as this is possible. There's a couple things I want to make sure you hear. In writing this, James is writing to a group of Jewish leaders, particularly the men that are in the, in the congregation, because that was the predominant way society and culture had it that day. But there were also many women and children that were listening to his message. So when James begins to speak, he's writing to them as a newly formed entity called the body of Christ or the church. Listen, please. And in being the new church, he's setting great standards early on so that the church can know how to conduct itself as it moves forward. In this meeting, there are people like Peter, and, and, and although, although Paul is not there yet, Paul is not far. He's probably still known as Saul at this time. If I do my history, I can probably verify that. But he's somewhere around because Paul or Saul never spent too much time away from the Christian church because he was too busy trying to kill him. So he, in this meeting, though, there are people like John and, and Matthias, and there are all of these apostles soon to be uh, greater in their ministries, and there are people like you and I that are just ordinary, and they're there because they, they are curious about this thing called church. Many people, even in this day, still don't know what they think they know about church. They think they have an understanding of the way things are, but the reality of it is, and James, James alludes to this, he says that if you have bitter envying in your heart and if you are still motivated by your own agenda and your own needs, you have missed the true essence of what this thing called the church is all about. Because ultimately what we do, we don't do for our own benefit. What we do, we do for the benefit of others and for the benefit of the kingdom. When I don't feel like coming to church, that's the time I should be in church. Because there's somebody that needs something that I have inside of me that's going to bless their life, potentially. If I'm doing it the right way, there might be a sister or a brother or, or a child that comes in and they might just need a hug like Elder Bell gives. They might just need a smile like you give. They might just need something to encourage them. And so when we turn the church into this, own, this spiritual bless me club and, and I come in only when I'm feeling the need for something from God, I need a touch, I need God, then I have missed the essence of what God intended for me to have because I have turned it into something sensual, devilish, and not of him. And so then what then is the remedy for my understanding to grow? The remedy is this, I have to learn that what I say carries more weight in the kingdom with God than what anybody else ever says to me, about me, or through me. Doesn't matter what they say behind your back, they gonna talk about you. And don't get all hyped up when they talk good things about you. I have had people that tell me, oh, Pastor Tommy, you are such a good preacher. I had one guy tell me one time, he said, Copeland ain't got nothing on you, and Savelle ain't got nothing on you. And I thought to myself, and neither does the devil, because you ain't talking straight here. 
Now that doesn't, that doesn't diminish what he said, but I see I've, I've learned that no matter how good they say I am, I'm never as good as the one who defines goodness. This is the first service, I gotta slow down. But I am only as good, and James alludes to this, as, as my maturity level begins to un get my mouth to engage with where I'm going. Many people, they would be much better off if they just shut their mouth. We got people that talk a good game. Christians are good for that. He says it, he says it here. He says, you know, you, you, know you, you, you boast about things and your boast is a lie. I don't have to boast about the goodness of God in my life. It's just the reality of who I am. And more importantly, of who he is. But see, what I've got to do, though, is I've got to discipline myself to this book because this book is the only book. I'm sorry. I'm not, forgive me. I'm not sorry. I don't apologize. I'm just telling you like it is. There is no other solution to life. And yet, as humans, humanity, we look for other solutions in other places. <laughs> there used to be, forgive me, there used to be a secular song called Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places. And many Christians, the reality of their, their quote-unquote Christian life is they, they want, listen, they want to have the, 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 the bitter water along with the sweet. How do I say that, Father? In other words, in other words, my wife and I, I'll use us as an example. Is that okay? Can I, can I, can I pick on us? Or should I pick on you? <laughs> Now, she'd probably rather I pick on you, but I'm going to pick on us. My wife and I ride down the street, and we like to drive many places that we go. We can fly sometimes, but most of the time we like to drive. And we're driving down the street, and I, and, and I, am, I am having a challenging day. Many of you don't have those, but I do have those from time to time. Forgive my humanity and my weakness, but I do have challenging days. And so I'm driving down, you know, and somebody cuts me off. I had somebody, I just, I just, this whole new intersection thing, it's been here about a little over a year now, but down there in front of Tyson's and, and that whole thing, y'all know what I'm talking about, where you, where you come, when you're coming in to, to, to Tiffin out of Coralville and the speed limit is, is genuinely 55 miles an hour, and then, or you're going the other way, going, heading to Coralville because you're finally out of Tiffin and you're going to lay on the gas and you're going down there and you're speeding along, 55, not 56, 55, and you're going along, and as you go along, and there's, there's this somebody sitting at that little intersection, and if you don't have your eyes in front of you, and I'm saying to myself, don't you do it, don't you do it, don't you do it, and they pull out in front of you, you're going 55 and they're going 20. I need great discipline over my mouth because I don't want to steer my ship into the waters of hell and Gehenna, because I certainly want to tell this person, have you lost your mind? Who gave you your license? Where did you get it from? You got it out of the Cracker Jack box. I know it to be true. And what is happening? The nature of humanity is rising up on the inside of me. And hopefully I have taken this rudder of my tongue and put it under the guidance and the tutelage of the Holy Ghost and demanded that don't you say it. I don't care what you feel. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care how bad it looks. Shut your mouth and bless that woman. Don't curse her. Now, that's a silly illustration, but that's the best one I can come up with. So, so, so let's look a little bit more, a little bit deeper at what James says. Go, go back to verse 8 for me. Are you there? Yes. Verse 8 says, well, let me get there. He says here, but the tongue. <laughs> now, remember, the Bible doesn't exaggerate. Can no man tame. So then how is it possible that I could put a governance over it? Well, I don't know how many of you are seaworthy and nautical and, and have had time looking at ships and, and, and being around those type of things. But on every ship, I don't care. And, and, you know, I said ship, not canoe. I said ship, not John boat. Okay, every ship that has a motor, has a sail, has a rudder. And because of that, there has to be some ability to steer the ship where you need it to go, not where it wants to go. 
your life is characterized here by James. He says, no man can tame. He says, it is un an unruly evil. In other words, it does not want to cooperate with you. Now, look up at me for a second. I don't care how spiritual you look this morning. <laughs> I don't care how spiritual you look. I know you don't care how spiritual I look. I don't care how spiritual you look. When you leave this place, you are going to face something that your tongue is, one, is going to want to talk about. <laughs> it might not be somebody pulling out in front of you. You know what most of us will face? Financial issues. Mm. And we'll say the wrong thing more than we'll say the right thing. I just want to make sure it's still on. You'll say something about your body, even though the word of God contradicts what's getting ready to come out your mouth. How do I know that? Well, Jesus said Matthew 12, I think it is. I don't know if I have it in my notes, but Matthew 12, Jesus says that, um, that a man or a human shall give an account for every idle word. Isn't that right? So what is an idle word in that context? Let me, let me see if I, I think I've got it here somewhere. Are you all right? Can I have a few more minutes? An idle word, whether I have it here or not, I've got it. Uh, I know it, but I want to say it right to you so I don't want to mess you up. An idle word is a word from the literal Greek that is lazy. Mm, think about that for a minute. It is lazy. There it is. Oh, my little note in the back. It is lazy. Think about this now, and I'm going to come back to that little rudder. It is uh, a word that is at leisure and free from labor. Remember what I said a few weeks ago. The purpose of language and words is the, the least purpose of language and words is what? Who remembers what I said? Communication. Think about this for a minute. Are y'all right? Okay. Communication is not the main purpose of words. Dominion is. Dominion. Are you hearing me this morning? In other words, when God created Adam, now we're, we're just like him. You and I are just like Adam and Eve. And that will become increasingly more revelational to you the closer you get to God. I'm right about it. Amen. So when I get close to God, now I can give you evidence, but I don't have time to go there. Enoch was, is a good example. Remember Enoch? Not much written about him in the Bible. He was so close to God, the Bible literally says that he, he, was, he walked with God and was not. In other words, he was so close to God that all of a sudden he was gone. And the people lo looking around had to be wondering, where, where did Enoch go? Where did Enoch go? I just know, I know he, was, he, was, he, was always, he was always that spiritual guy. He's always praying. He was always loving God. Next thing you know, poof, he gone. Now he will be one of the great witnesses in Revelation. Okay, I don't have time to go there. Anyway. So, but with that, with that, with that, understand this, when I communicate, I communicate, James implies this, I, I take the poison of my naturally governed mouth and I change the jurisdictional authority of it by speaking God's word into a sweet blessing stream. When I say to Roger, you are blessed and highly favored among men. I'm not just saying it, even if I don't understand what I'm saying. The words themselves, in line with God's word, makes him want to be that. Amen. That's why you can't go out here and just say any old thing to your children. Amen. Or to your husband. If your husband acting ugly, it's probably your fault. You know, uh, uh, don't write me no bad, I'm not reading them, I'm just telling you like it is. And if your wife act ugly, it's probably your fault. Amen. But I'm going to tell you something. You can't, in order, you've heard me say this before, in order for something to exist, it has to first have permission from your mouth. Okay, so, back to the rudder. So, what I'm doing is the rudder is filled, the tongue is filled with deadly poison. It is not, it is, I, I use my, my, my grandson, Dominic. His tongue right now, even though it can't speak, is filled with deadly poison. It simply is. It just is because by nature of birth. Huh? Because he was born into a world that has sin in it. You cannot dislodge sin except through the blood of Jesus. 
and you have to override it by applying that blood and applying the word to your life. So then it is my responsibility, her responsibility, and his parents' responsibility to teach him how to talk. So if I teach him, listen, if, I, if, 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 I, if he comes up and all he hears is, oh, I'm sick, oh, I'm tired, you know, you know, this family always suffers from the flu or it suffers from heart disease and high blood pressure. If that's all he hears, that's what his mouth is going to begin to speak and he doesn't even know how he got there. Many of us are in situations that we did not create ourselves. Ancestrally. And culturally, we have learned words that are not in line with God's word and simply cannot produce anything other than what they've been directed to produce. I cannot change my life unless I'm willing to change my words. Faithful words are the most powerful tools known to man. I can stop a, I can stop, a, listen, I'm going to use this one because it's just, I can stop a truck, Matt truck from coming over into my lane with my words more than I can my ability to drive. Yeah. Okay, I hope I'm helping somebody. L let me keep going. It says, it says then, verse 10, James 3 and 10. Well, I, no, no, I'm going to back up. Turn, turn to 1 Peter 3. Would you do that? Just flip over. If you're in James, just real close. Next book over, 1 Peter 3. Hold your place in James. I'm going to come back there. 1 Peter 3, verse 10. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. When you have a say amen, so I can know you're there. Thank you, Lord. Now, I'm going to read this. Gentlemen, if you put the King James Version up, when you find it, 1 Peter 3 and 10, I'm going to read this from the Expanded Bible because I like the way it sounds and, 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 and what it says. As soon as I find it here, I'll read it. It says, the scripture says, a person must do these things or the one who wants to enjoy life and have many happy days. How many people want to enjoy life and have many happy days? That should be everybody, okay? He must, listen, must not say evil things. Keep his tongue from evil. Then he goes on, this verse says, and he must not tell lies, keeping his lips from speaking lies. Now, with that being said, what, what Peter is implying, now Peter's at the same meeting that James is, is same teaching that James, he's heard it, he's read it, he's, he's probably there. Now remember when James writes, he doesn't break it up into chapter and verse. It's one continuous letter. But what, what Peter says is that if you're going to really enjoy life, you have to do something about your tongue. I know it's not a popular teaching because most of us, we want to say what we want to say and ain't nobody going to tell me what I can say and what I can't. But I'm going to tell you the manifestation of this, where it's gone. And this is what the Lord gave me this morning as he laid on my heart. The greatest platform for cursing men in the 21st century to date has been social media. I don't, I'm, I'm not on most social media. I'm not knocking it. You, you do what you do. I couldn't tell, I, I didn't even know how to open Facebook. I mean, you know, I did. Many of you heard me talk about the first, first message I preached in here on a Tuesday night, on a Wednesday night, excuse me, uh, you know, was we get ready to celebrate seven years, first message, man, I was fired up. I was ready to preach. I was ready to take this church to the next level. JT, I was wound up, man. It was a Wednesday night. I was loaded for bear. I was going to just let it rip, give somebody some word, teach them, bless them. They're going to get better. They're going to love me. I preached that message on a Wednesday night. I got upstairs and I got a phone call. And it wasn't to bless me. It was from an individual who should not have called me and said, I just heard on Facebook that you preached a political message. I said, I just got home. How you know that? You weren't even in this. That person wasn't even living in the state. So that person that heard that message ran to their phone, cell phone, and called this individual because he felt like this individual had some influence over me and was going to tell me how bad I preached. First message. Y'all ain't getting it. First message. That's the way to set the course, isn't it? That'll make you feel good about coming down the next time to preach. Uh-huh. James said that these things, your words, these words are filled with deadly poison. One translation says the poison of the asp or the viper. I heard Mark, Mark Barkley say this. Many of you may not know who Mark Barkley is. He's a pretty profound preacher, and he, he is part of the circle of influence that, I, that my wife and I follow and some of you. He said, when, stand up, Kelsey. He said, when, when somebody 
speaks. And he was inferring Christian. I don't care what a sinner says about me. What a sinner says about me is never going to bother me. They call me, they call me, you know, narrow minded. They call me irrelevant. They call me all these things. Who cares? Who cares? Y'all shouldn't care. I don't care. But when I come into the house of God and I'm in around the influence of people that love me, he said, Mark Barker was giving a demonstration, turn around, face them, please. He said, when they come and they say something to you and it is not in line with God's word or like James says, it's evil, full of deadly poison, it is like a spiritual serpent that latches onto you and injects its venom into you and you don't even know that you've been bit. And it's just like a rattlesnake or an adder or anything else. You don't feel the effects until you start walking away. Are you feeling me? And Christians do it all the time. Good place to say amen. Now, there are some people that do it intentionally. Oh, help me, Lord. I'm being pastoral now. I'm starting to meddle. Didn't mean to get here, but I'm here now. Don't be the one. Don't be the one to put your mouth on somebody else. Don't be the one. God will judge you severely. God going God to do his best to get you by the Holy Ghost to stop doing that. If you put your mouth on somebody, you better recognize they do not belong to you. You do not have the right. So in that, and I'm saying this, I'm saying this in the context of even people that you interact with here. When we go through our new partners orientation, it's just that orientation, just information. You don't have to, at the end of the day, you don't have to join or you just get the information. I hope you join, but you don't have to. But, but with this understanding, I tell people all the time, every class that we've had for the last seven years, I tell them all the time, there are going to be people in this house that are going to say bad things about you. I wish it weren't so. I wish, I wish that we had a bunch of mature people all the way around. But you know, you can really tell where somebody's at. All you got to do is walk up to them and say hello. How you doing? Well, once it starts off that way, it can't go nowhere but south. Let me tell you. Huh? And you're thinking, okay, <laughs> am I ready for this? Because you're trying to be polite and cordial. You want to be, you know, you don't want to just walk away from them. But I'm going to tell you the best thing to do is you need to check that. You didn't tell them. You didn't check that. Whatever's getting ready to come out, whatever's getting ready to follow well, be careful. See, we don't do that because we're not mature enough to be able to. See, most of us don't like confrontation. <laughs> but as a believer, as a disciple, confrontation is inevitable, baby. And the higher and the, and the greater degree to which you will face confrontation is, the, is really the determining factor of whether or not you're ready for God's next move in your life. I wish I had more time. All right. So the other side of that and where I was going with that and where I'll conclude is this. I'm not finished, but it's a good stopping point. Is on the social media side of things. Because for the vast majority, I, I, I've learned, I learned this from, from hearing Brother Copeland say it years ago. I don't pay any attention when people brag on me. Um, I, I, I say to many of you that have been around me long enough know this is a common statement with me. I, I take, there's two things I take out of the equation of my life, particularly concerning ministry. I have to, because I couldn't last if I didn't. And many people don't. One is emotions. I take my emotions out of my Christian discipleship. I take my emotions out of it. I don't wear them on my sleeve. You got to stop doing it. It is, a, it, is a, it is a scarlet letter for offense. You are a target for offense if you do not deal with the emotional realm of your life. You are a target. The devil is setting you up. He can't wait to bring some well-meaning, well-versed, uh, supposedly mature Christian along your way to disrail you, to move you into a place where you don't, next thing you know, you out of fellowship with God and you have not even recognized that it was something simply somebody said. They didn't even shove you. They didn't push you. They didn't trip you. They didn't come along and clock you with something. They simply spoke to you out of ignorance and out of a viperous tongue and you have, you have borne the poison of it and you don't even know what happened in your life. Emotions. The second thing is this, ego. There's no place in, in, in Christianity or discipleship, particularly ministry, of, for ego. None. Absolutely none. And I've seen some of, the, some of the most vile people that I've seen are egotistical and they're emotional. 
I could name a name. I'll, I'll tell you about the individual. I won't name the name. There's an individual that, that I know. Uh, I haven't met, her, met this individual personally, but I know. And all I hear is every encounter that somebody that I've met that has worked with this woman who is of, of very prominent stature and has great ministry, and she is one of the most hard, one of the hardest people to work with and to get along with in, in ministry and life. And yet thousands upon thousands of people follow her and think she's hot stuff. And the challenge is she thinks she's hot stuff from what I understand. And if there's, there's, there's no room for that. There's no room for, for it from the pulpit to the parking lot. There's no room for it. Now, I'm, not talking about, I'm not talking about just you. I'm talking about me. But I'm talking about you too. Y'all ain't saying amen, so maybe say ouch. Huh? Because either we're going to get it right and live this happy life and live in a, an abundant state. It's not that God isn't, God, Pastor Nett says something that I know is true. And you may, maybe you heard it and picked up on it, but maybe you didn't. But I know this is true. It's the, the blessing of the Lord, uh, the blessing of the Lord, which can be found in Galatians 3, okay, and other places, but primarily there. That's one thing. The blessings of the Lord that stem out of that blessing, they're not, they aren't going anywhere. Let me clarify it this way. There is, in my life, just like there was a church waiting for me, this church was waiting for me, for she and I, and you, because you're here, if you're partnered here, but it was waiting for me back when, I'll just go to, I'll just pick a date and time, back when I got born again, back in the early 90s. This was, the, this was, this was on the path. All I had to do was keep walking. I wasn't even looking for it. Are you feeling me? So to the point where there was even somebody else, and this individual told me this, there was even somebody else that had to start it before it was made prepare, prepared for me. And what God had to do was allow them to move out of the way so I could get here. Oh, boy, I wish I had time. The blessing of the Lord upon my life, the Bible says, it maketh rich and adds no sorrow with it. So I say that to say, as much as I love, live, and enjoy living upstairs above this building, there's a house waiting for me to walk through the doors. But I got to keep walking. And I have to teach my mouth to always speak what God has shown me and told me in his word. I can't speak about a slanted ceiling where I bump my head all the time. I can't speak about a tiny bathroom where I can barely fit, but that's the place where I have to take my shower. I'm taking y'all into my reality here. I have to say, but God, you said, no matter what it looks like, no matter what it feels like, and no matter what other people say, I stay on the course of what God has said. That's why the Bible says that the tongue is an unruly member full of deadly poison, set on fire of hell. We set the course of life. Either we say good things or we say bad things, but no matter what we say, we eat the fruit thereof. That's all the time I got. I'm just getting wound up, but that's all the time I got. I want more time. I want to keep going. I could keep going easily, but you couldn't endure it. Hallelujah. We, we, you know, I, I, it's, it's so simple. You know, and, and the simplicity of, of, of Christianity, God has done everything. How many of y'all believe in for something? I don't care what it is. Don't tell me what it is. How many believe in for something? Okay. Can I tell you that it's already in existence? I did, I did the little illustration the other day, and, and how many of you, if you were here last week, and I did the illustration with the paper, I don't think I did in the first service, I think I did in the second service, where, where everything in God is already in eternity, and everything we need comes from that realm. Yeah. And somebody told me afterwards, I said, said you know, I, I didn't get that, I didn't quite get that. I know you don't get it. That's why, I, that's why we say things over and over again. Yeah, some of you got it, because you're ready for it. So if I'm believing God, for the resources, for the, for the sales, for the customers, for the clients, for, for healing, for deliverance, for prosperity, for, for a husband or a wife. If I'm believing God, they already exist in the realm of God. All I got to do is say the right thing and believe the right thing and stay on the course that God has set. If I can stay faithful to the word of God, if I can stay true to my, oh my God, to my God who has supplied all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I can have what I say. And we have complicated that because we think we got to pray 12 hours. If God tells you to pray 12 hours, pray. Yes. He tells you to sow, sow. 
He knows what he's doing. You don't. Amen. Stand to your feet. Glory to God. Yes. Mm. 